My name is Brian Kelsey, and I decided to build a late-night talk show set in my suburban garage and challenge myself to see who the most famous of people I could get to stop by. I run all the cameras and equipment myself and, and just hope that nothing goes wrong. This is 10 Minutes With. Me come through the I curtain. did. I enjoyed that. Yeah, thanks, hey, everybody. Uh, it's Brian Kelsey. Welcome to the show. That, of course, is always is Pete Chifo. Pete, your hair is, yeah. is uh, growing long. It looks great. Thank you. COVID. It's longer than mine. It's COVID hair. Yeah. Yeah, I thought coming through there would be more um, late night ish. I think so. And plus, it's, uh, it's, it's cold. actually it's, it's cold outside, cold. too. We've got a great show for you. Craig Melvin from the Today Show is here. In fact, Pete, he's sitting outside right now. In fact, let's, yes, let's turn. Can we turn on the external camera there? And oh, there he is. He's got a fire. He's nice and warm. Put a little drink. Uh, so we'll get to him in a second. But he, he, he's all set. We have to take care of some business in here first. Uh, Pete, you know, occasionally, just occasionally, uh, there are guests we invite on the show that for one reason or another are, are not interested in joining us here in the program. I don't know why, you know, we provide them with a fire outside and a, a beverage, but they, they say no. We like to celebrate these Little Misfortunes with a segment we like to call Electronic Mail Rejection Letters. Oh, Jesus. Oh, wow. Electronic Mail Rejection Letters. Pete, these are sent electronically over the um, internet service. That's how we get these. Number one. Hi, Brian, and thank you for reaching out about Seth Myers. We so appreciate your interest. Unfortunately, with Seth's schedule, we're going to politely decline on his behalf. Thank you again for your interest, Lauren. You know what I was going to do? I wanted, um, I thought it'd be funny. You know, he, he, he was doing his show from, I think, his parents-in-law house, which is not far from here. So I thought we could go and maybe like interview him with a bullhorn out the window. He said, no, we're small potatoes. They said no. Can we check in on Craig again? Is he still out there? Turn on the external camera, please, Pete. He's still there. All right, we'll be out in a second. Electronic mail rejection letter number two. Thank you, but he is not doing interviews at this time. Jessica. He, uh, he's actually really funny. And he has a great podcast. He doesn't live far from me. These are all people who live sort of close by, so there's maybe a chance that they would actually come on here. We went to high school together. Oh, that's right. You went to high yeah. school with him. Can yeah, you... he was old. He was older. We passed each other in the hall. So. Ah. Well, maybe we could use some of your hmm. oomph to yeah. get him on the show, but he's not coming. Finally, electronic mail rejection letter number three. Hi, Brian. Thank you for thinking of Tom, but he's not doing any interviews right now. Thank you, Alejandra. Is he still doing uh, uh, Dance with the Stars? I believe he was canned from that, so that may have something to, really? to do. Really? Boy, I'm out of the I'm out of the loop. Tyra Banks, maybe. Uh, well, he's not doing any interviews at this time. Electronic mail, rejection, letters. Are played. My guest today is a weekday news anchor on the Today Show, Pete, and also host of the third hour of Today, and has covered some of the most historic events in the past few years. Thanks for joining us. I'm Craig Melvin. Craig Melvin. I'd like to keep it down in the studio. his violin. Craig Melvin grew up in Columbia, South Carolina and started his broadcast career in high school and continued during his time at Wofford College and then to a local station, WIS. Scott Hawkins, you could spend Wait. all day down here. It's like a museum. Oh, really? Saffron's, yeah, it's uh, behind the Texaco on Whaley Street. Then worked his way up to DC to WRC-TV and after a few short years there, he hit the national stage, became the anchor for NBC News and MSNBC, and began filling in as a co-host on Weekend Today, eventually becoming that full-time co-host. Finally, in 2018, Craig moved to the weekday news anchor chair on one of the highest rated, most successful shows on television, The Today Show. Is there a scenario in which that officer would have been justified, was justified in firing his weapon? Tuesday night, the 10th debate, you, you seemed keen on, on mixing it up a bit more. What took so long? Are you at a point in your life where you want the legacy to be about more than basketball? Craig seemed so genuine to me on television and seemed to have such a great sense of humor, so I was dying to get him in the chair in the driveway. It took over a year, but we got him. 
Please welcome a man who nearly went blind from sleeping with his contacts in. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Craig Melvin. What's up, dude? There you go. This is great. Welcome. This is, I'm going to tell you, this puts Studio 1A to shame. Yes, well, you know, we, 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 we tried to make it comfortable. How you doing? I'm great. Bourbon's great. Fire's great. Did you really uh, sleep with a contact in? Oh, not just once. I was doing this. I was doing it for years. Really? Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> my ophthalmologist years ago said I had some contact lenses that were extended wear. So I thought extended meant multiple days. Apparently, that's bad for you. Oh, boy. Well, this I, is great, by the way. This yeah, concept is. You like it? Well, I you do. Know, we got a little, we, we, knew does, you, we, we did a little research. Does Pete ever get out? And Pete does Oh, Pete, of course. Pete's, uh, oh, okay. you know, we do a little, oh, okay. a little stuff in the beginning. You know, what I do is, uh, what you just missed before, is I read rejection letters of, of guests who <laughs> have politely declined. Can you imagine declining this request? I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine. Now, normally people are, no are right here, but of course with COVID, right. we're, you know, and so why why stop? Just go in the driveway. Yeah, this is great. It now, gets no easier. speaking of COVID, when you uh, when we first uh, switched over to COVID and everyone was locked down, um, the whole journalistic world, everyone turned into essentially a YouTuber. You had to do everything yourself. I mean, yeah. for, at least for a little bit. Uh, how how did you make that transition? Running the cameras, running the like that we do here actually, running the cameras, the lights, everything. Uh, I, I didn't make the transition well, I'll tell you that much. I, I, had, I did have an advantage of because when I first started in the business, I was a photographer. I shot video, did some producing. So, but the technology has changed so much, you know, since since I was doing it. Um, but the fr it was, first week or two, it was it was really spotty because we were basically using like laptops and iPads, and and you remember like everyone was at home like that, so we were all sharing Wi-Fi. So. You know, we'd be up and then all of a sudden you'd be halfway through a segment and, you know, and you just, you disappear. <laughs> After that, they sent some crews out to install um, home studios for, for a lot of us, uh, akin to what you have here, although not as nice. So now it's, it, it's one of those setups where I literally flip a switch, dial a number, and I'm, I'm patched through to, to New York and can do the show out of the basement. But I've been going in too, so. Yeah, I think most people are, are kind of going back in. And um, how was it? How was the, uh, I, mean, I know, um, obviously you can see on the show, everyone's spread out. Mm -hmm. What Did they have any other, other guidelines and stuff when you're in? We set? are uh, tested very often, uh, very, very often. Um, to protect the bubble. We don't allow people in the studio that, that haven't been tested recently. Um, that, so that's, that's different. It's actually, Brian, it's a lot better because for a while it was me and um, it was Hoda and Savannah was working from home and, and Roker was working from home. So it was basically just the two of us in there for months. Um, so we really got to know each other very well. And then slowly and gradually folks started coming back into the studio. But that didn't start happening until four or five months ago? Yeah. Uh, speaking of Al Roker, I, you know, I'm trying to do a lot of research. And by the way, any any critical feedback on the interviewing process is greatly, greatly appreciated. I don't think you need any feedback. Oh, come on now. I mean, this Listen. Is so nice open-ended questions. You give your guests time to answer. This is wonderful. <laughs> a little research. Al Roker once said that you are one good-looking, sweet piece of man candy. What is your relationship with uh, Al? I know he's been sort of a mentor to you. He is like, he's like a second father. People are always like, oh, you know, who are your favorites? And I love them all, uh, but, but I would walk across hot coals for Al Roker. Like he is um, salt of the earth, nice, kind, generous. Um, and you know, he's been in the game a long time, Brian. Like he's, he just celebrated 40 years. I think it was last year, 40 years in the business. Um, and he's just, you know, you've done this long enough to know that oftentimes when that little red light goes off, um, a lot of folks who seem nice on TV, they're generally jackasses. Um, <laughs> not Roker. Yeah. Even when we used to have back in the day, when we would have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people show up in the morning, Roker would, would be the only one who would go out and regardless of the temperature, shake hands, say hello to every single person. Um, now that could speak volumes about his workload, um, but I, I contend it speaks volumes about the kind of guy that he is. So he's just institution, a national treasure. One of the things um, that uh, I was reading was, I think it was last July, 
on the air and the emotions got the best of you. I yeah. think you kind of broke down, um, which I'm surprised that doesn't happen more often yeah. in, in all of broadcasting in this climate. How do you disassociate the news and when you get home? Like, how do you, do you can you turn it off when you get home? I, you, I used yeah. to be able to do it a, a lot better. And I, I think now, for me, um, when I had when I had kids, I became like just a complete puddle, just a just a mush ball. Um, because I think now, oftentimes, I see things uh, through that lens, you know, the, through the lens of a parent. And what happened last last spring is we were doing a story on teachers, and you know, my mom was a teacher, and um, my mother in law was a teacher, then a principal, come from a long line of educators. And we were talking about just the, the toll that the pandemic was, was having, the toll it was taking on, on teachers and students and, um, and parents at that point as well. Uh, and yeah, I, I for a moment forgot that I was on television and was a broadcast journalist and I was, I was a dad. Um, and, and that's what happened. But you know what? I, I think that I've always probably worn my heart on my sleeve more than most. But I contend that that's that that's something that makes makes you a better journalist. Like when you um, when you stop being affected um, by despair and loss and tragedy and anguish, and when those things stop affecting you, uh, you should probably find a new line of work. You know, it it should it should affect you, especially now. Now that being said, you know I I don't go losing it every day on TV, but um, but I do think. Yeah, school shooting or mass shootings, especially. I, you know, I've covered close to a dozen uh, mass shootings, and every time I cover one of those, um, it it it's like a, a punch in the gut because it's, you know, someone's son or daughter um, who left that day expecting to come home, and through no fault of their own, they're not. Um, so yeah, those those stay with me. I, mean, I used to be able to check at the door, but. Yeah, you know, now the pandemic hit. I just, I, at Lynn's and I, you know, should we talk about it? And I'm a firm believer in therapy as well. But, yeah, you got, you got to talk. Now, do you talk to your kids? You've got so you've got Dell and Sybil, two kids. Yeah, they're they're, they're young. They're young. I, so, can, can do they ask questions? Oh yeah, that's a lot of questions, especially my son who's almost seven. How do you approach that? Uh, it depends on the subject matter. Uh, sometimes I'll answer honestly, and and sometimes I just lie um, because. It also depends on the mood that I'm in. Like if I've got, you know, if you've got 10 minutes to get into it, sometimes I'm like, you know, it's, it's like 930, buddy. Like we, you know, we're not having a, a conversation on existentialism right now. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it's, it's funny because especially with the pandemic, I mean, he lots of questions about coronavirus and, uh, you know, when are we going to be able to do this and when are we going to be able to do that? And, um, but it's, it's also weird how quickly kids adapt. Like a year ago, if I'd asked my, my son to, I need you to put that mask on so we can uh, go to, like, what are you talking about? Now he's like, Dad, you get your mask? Got your, ma got your backup mask? Get your backup mask? Is your mask clean? You washing your mask? All right, thanks. Thanks, mask patrol. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, we, 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 we do talk. I, I, um, it's funny because we're probably of the same generation. When we were growing up, I, and I asked my dad a question, and oftentimes the response was, oh, because I said so. That's that is that is the 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 soundtrack to my childhood. Oh yeah, Be because because I was like, oh okay, well because well, that makes all sense. Right. So, all right, all right, fine. And you me. went on your merry little way, <laughs> and and now you know you 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 do better when you know better, and we know that you know when you answer your child's questions, it builds legitimate curiosity, and we want our children to be curious, so we have to feed that curiosity. But you know, there's some days where I'm sick of feeding curiosity. I know. I think. I think you said once your favorite holiday is, is Father's Day, which uh, is mine. My yeah. hands down. My favorite word is Dad and Father's yes. Day. Is, why for you is it your your favorite holiday? Oh, B. You know, this isn't a knock on moms at all. Of I, course not. I just moms wrote, are great. Just wrote a book. Uh, it's coming out um, in time for Father's Day. It's called Pops, and um, and I talk about this in the book. There's a, a bit that Chris Rock used to do years ago. Um, and he talked about all the love that moms get over the, like during the course of the year, everyone loves mom. You know, it's all, you know, mom gets like the handmade gifts and he's like, dad, dad gets the big piece of chicken. That's kind of it. <laughs> and that's, Which I, nothing wrong with that. No, but no, I know, who doesn't, yeah. who 
doesn't love a nice quarter? Of course. Uh, uh, but but that's kind of and and so I do think that um, again, as we learn more, we we do more, um, and we know now that dads deserve to be celebrated as well. So um, I like the fact that one day out of the year, it's all about dad. You know, dad gets to sleep in or. Dad gets to maybe have more than the two bourbons, uh, but and it's so I it, it also for me I had a, uh, a a complicated relationship with my father for most of my life, and we just sort of um, got to a good place a few years ago. And the, the book that I, I just I, I wrote is a, a, a lot of, a lot of it's about that uh, complicated dynamic, but um, but it's it's also for me a, a sort of a, an annual reminder of uh how far i've come with my dad yeah um, so it's a, it's a different um uh raising kids is a lot different than it was i think when we were little um like you said i mean there was a lot of like just do as i say kids now have so much more access to everything I mean, there's obviously through the internet and yeah. they, they 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 know more yep. and it's it's harder to to fight back i find and yeah. they're like well you know dad according to google right you know and so it's tough i know too much information, I would contend. Hey, Craig, would you mind throwing another log on that fire there? Oh, I'll do it. No, no, this is good. I'm going to put one right there. Um, let's talk about Lindsay because, so Lindsay, your wife, is also a journalist. Yes, um, a better journalist, been, I would contend. But. Well, now that's what I was going to ask you. Who do you think is the better interviewer? Oh, she would, she would, she would say herself. She would. Uh, she, of course. So now, Lindsay. So you guys, uh, you guys met where in uh, down in D.C. We met during a commercial break. At the um, uh, NBC station in Washington D.C. in 2008, that's kind of how it all started. That, that's been I think, more than 10 years ago. I know time flies. Now, was there any any issues, any interracial issues that came up with families? You know, it's funny. I, you know, my my mom uh, grew up in a different era, so it wasn't as commonplace. Obviously, in South Carolina back in the 70s, um, but we were sort of reared to be. I know it sounds cheesy, but somewhat colorblind. She didn't. She didn't. She didn't take issue with it. Um, her parents didn't really take issue with it. Like it wasn't a. It wasn't a thing. Um, but no. Yeah. So um, this has been a really uh, tough year for everybody. Um, I think for you and I actually both. I lost my dad in uh, in July. Um, I'm sorry. I know you lost your 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 brother Lawrence. Uh, Colon cancer, right? Yeah. Uh, in December. Yeah, just a few weeks ago. Tell me a, a great memory of Lawrence. What's a, a great oh memory? oh? There's there there are, there are a lot. Um, you know, he was a, a Baptist minister, um, and I couldn't be farther from from a, being a Baptist minister. We were very different uh, growing up. Man of, of great faith, and um, one of my favorite memories was also one of one of our last memories. And uh, going back to this book that I just mentioned, um, there's a chapter uh, in 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 which I write about the dynamic between um, uh, my younger brother, myself, him, our dad, and you know, just sort of what it was like growing up. And um, and we knew at this point that that um, the end was was near, but I wanted it was very important to me that he sign off on his section. So. You know, I, I um, was in there, and at this point, he was wasn't really able to speak a whole lot, and I'm, you know, blubbering through his section and reading, and and I get to the end, looking for affirmation, and I said, uh, I said, what'd you think? Was it all there? And he said, oh, oh. I said, that bad? He said, no, no, it's fine. You remember too much. <laughs> that was it. I said, is that, is that it? Is that is it good? He said, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I was like, all right, no, I'm gonna take it to print. Um, so that the, he he approved of, of his section in the book, and uh, that was um, that was very demonstrative of, of his his sense of humor. He had a very um, I'll, I'll tell you this too. Um, toward the end, um, I was I called him up because his his wife had said that. He'd uh, he'd passed out at the house, and he'd had to go to the hospital, and and um, and that was a big thing for him. He didn't want to die in a hospital; he wanted to die at home, on his terms. So I'm, I'm talking to him um, the day after he came to, and I said, 
Meadows, I called him by his last name. I said, Meadows, what, what, what happened? He said, man, I won't use the colorful language. Again, he was a Baptist minister, but toward the end, I guess he figured uh, to hell with it. But he said, man, I was, I was feeling a little lightheaded. And next thing I know, I'm being carried out of my own damn house by two fat white guys. <laughs> and I said, man, I am not going out like this. I said, I said, well, I said well, what did you tell him? I said, he said, I said, put me down. And fortunately, they did not. They, they, they took him to the hospital. But um, the two fat white guys, that was, that was all he needed uh, to decide that, that he was, was going to live for a few more weeks just so he could get home and die in his house. Yeah. Well, you know, I know you've been a, bit a, a big advocate for colonoscopy. Um, Have you had yours? I did. I had mine a year ago. Good. Clean as a whistle. I, Pete, Pete just had hit. Pete, you've had like five, haven't you? Pete's two. had two. What, but you don't seem that old. Family history. Look at Pete. I know. Pete's and Pete's a young Way to go. It's funny. I had my first one a few years ago, Brian. And, 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 and the doctor, you know, the doctor's like, all right, Mr. Melvin, start counting backwards from 20. I'm going to. I'm going to go ahead and inject the propofol. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get to 20, really? I'm like, 20, 19, 18, and I'm like, boom, gone. And That's I wake crazy. up, and the doctor's like, all right, well, everything seemed to check out. I was like, are you going to do it? He's like, well, he did it. I said, what? Yeah, I know. And I, but I said to him, I was like, you guys are selling this wrong. Yeah, you're selling Don't sell the colonoscopy. Sell the propofol oh, experience. I, I got to tell you, I'd never been under anything ever at all. I didn't know what to expect. And the guy's just, he's like, he's putting it in and then he starts telling me this really, like, foul joke. <laughs> I didn't even have time to laugh. And then, and it was done. It was, uh, it was, it was amazing. And I woke up, I was kind of refreshed. I felt, I had a great sleep. Yes! It was fantastic. I was so pissed at the, I was like, you guys, for 15 years, you've been doing oh, this wrong. Come on. Don't sell the treatment, sell the, although he did make a good point. He's like, you know, the propofol can be deadly. And I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> There's that, but if someone that. else is doing, you know, if you're going to, you're just getting your, yeah, your, your, your you plumbing checked. You can sleep with it every night. I mean, Fine, that's bad of for course. You, but yeah, so I'm looking forward to my next colonoscopy. I can't wait. I got mine in, uh, I don't know, how often, like another five years? Five or years. years. Five Unless years. you've got, you know, issues. Yeah. But. I think Pete and I are going together, right, Pete? I would watch that segment. <laughs> We're actually doing that, you know, not to, I guess, I guess when I'm breaking news. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do it on the show. Get out. Uh, Great. My, my younger brother is going to, uh, to to get a colonoscopy on the Today Show in an effort to encourage, um, you know, folks that look like me who have been especially dissuaded because of the pandemic um, to, to get checked. Wow. Look well, at your breaking news on the break show. It, I mean, breaking news right there. Wow. You've even got breaking news music. That's I love breaking it. music. Nice. I should have come on soon. This is great. I know. Free bourbon. Hey, how are we doing on time? I'm good for probably about seven more minutes. Nope, that's fine. We'll wrap it up. We'll, we'll end it right here. Craig Melvin, thank you so much for coming. Watch him on the Today Show forever and ever and ever. Thank you this so, so much. This has been great. I've really enjoyed this, especially the bourbon part. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, wow. This is how, oh, this is how it is? Oh, this is sad. That's really fun. Wow. Good night, folks.